All right. Welcome to season two of Duck It. We made it to the office, man. Amazing. <clears throat> we bought some fancy equipment, so we're going to be making some stupid noises here and there. Well, we bought all this before. Yeah. Pre-COVID. Okay. Pre-COVID. It was an investment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like been three months collecting dust in the office. Welcome to the Duck Life office. That's uh, our beautiful uh, logo. We have tons of ducks everywhere, as you can see. We got fancy new equipment. <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, season two, what a different world yeah. we're living in. Um, yeah, you know, season one was kind of cool. I think we learned a lot about the podcast, about ourselves. And I think we learned, um, that the world knows really well, um, how to panic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd agree. Um, but, uh, what do you make of this, uh, <clears throat> Facebook thing? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, um, so to give it context, Facebook um, at the moment, there's obviously been a lot of hoo-ha with, um, with the way that social networks have responded or reacted to a lot of the hate speech and things that have been going on, um, or things that have been published and then things that have been promoted. But now brands have reacted back and there's what, 70 plus brands that have. Yeah, and all the big boys, all the big spenders, right? Yeah, Coca yeah. Coca-Cola's, um, Starbucks. Yeah, so stop hate for profit. So yeah, what do I make it of? I mean, it, it's interesting that the um, that we've got to this point in terms of brands now taking a stand and boycotting social media. Um, but I, I think you have a perspective on the way that these brands are now reacting, which is following the consumer trends. So you know, quite clearly now the audience is starting to to shift their perspective in terms of um, you know what they're doing, the action they're taking, how they stand up, and now brands are, are following in that footstep. And um, overall, all in all, I mean, you know, as you know, when you think of the position that Zuckerberg is in, you know, how how do you create a community, you know, a social network, and then but then tell them what they can or can't say? Exactly. How do you censor? Yeah, I, I don't. Speech? I don't pretty much. I mean, personally, I don't really get it. Um, I mean, I agree with the fundamental idea that the hate speech is not a good thing, and that people that mm -hmm. practice hate speech, you know. Yep. You know, they're fucking assholes and they're idiots and they're, you know, not good contributors to society. But I don't know if Facebook is supposed to kind of parent these people. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's removing a lot of the a lot of freedoms that and people that that people have. So if we get down, if we go down this path of censorship on social. To remove hate speech, to remove someone's point of view, which we don't agree with. Like. But I, I hate that we're making a distinction between brands and people. There is I, I think that's that's fundamentally the problem that I have with it. I think it's like, okay, if, if you know, Donald Trump wants to, you know, say a bunch of shit that's kind of mean, that's okay. But if Coca-Cola, yeah. you know, wants to put an ad on a platform that doesn't uh, kind of censor it, then, you know, you know that's yeah. wrong. What the hell, man? Like, like, if I go on Twitter right now or Instagram and I say a bunch of shit about somebody I don't like personally, that's okay. <laughs> Right. And like, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing illegal. And I can say whatever the fuck I want to say. I can go on Twitter and say, yeah. Steve's a moron. Mm -hmm. and, and that's OK. But if a brand now, you know, if I become a brand ambassador for Duck Life. Mm -hmm. And then next day I say Steve's a moron and they disagree with me and they leave with me. I mean, what's the difference? Right. Like, yeah, there's no difference. There's a huge distinction being made now between what brands are allowed to do and people are allowed to do. I think fundamentally the problem that I, I mean, the nut of the problem is why is there so much fucking hate speech? Mm. Right? There's obviously an increase in hate speech. There's obviously an increase in. in Has in, there been an increase though? Or is it that. Yeah, I think people are more left and more right than they've ever been. There used yeah, to be a bigger proportion of people in the middle. But was it there? It was always there, right? But there was never a platform. Sure. There was never a place or it was never seen as acceptable to to speak out. So it's not like it's ever not been there, it's just been under the radar. Whereas now, arguably you could, you know, without pointing fingers, um, we should. Um, but it's, you know, that speech has been given a platform and then over time, it's like the media with anything, if, you, if it's repeated enough, it becomes socially acceptable to then speak out and be part of that and you just join a, a herd. And that's what we've started to see more, I think, um, you know, going back all the way back, 2016 was probably a turning point in the lead up to um, in the UK Brexit and then the US elections. 
that was a turning point in terms of the yeah. way social yeah, media society's, was used. Society's definitely gotten way more polarizing. The way people use media, the way people, I mean, from the U.S. election to Brexit in the U.K. to pretty much any you know, political group on the left or the right side of politics is using social yeah. media as a weapon. And, yep. and, and obviously there has been some abuses on, on, on that front, but fundamentally that's the problem. The problem mm-hmm. is the abuse. It's the hate speech itself. Yeah. Right? And, and, and I think the hate speech is there because politicians have asked people to pick one or the other. Yes. There is no middle ground anywhere anymore. Right? Like, like you're either pro or against. Yeah. There's nothing in between. Like, you are for this candidate or for that candidate or right. for this ethos or against this ethos. Yeah. And that's crazy. Like, I don't, I'm not black and white on anything. It's true. Right? So it's like everybody's going to... And, and sure, I am probably more leaning left than I am leaning right for sure. But there are some circumstances where I'm leaning right. Right? So it's like... I think that's fundamentally the problem is that that has always existed, yes. And today you are kind of encouraged to vocalize it. Right? And on the left, political correctness is an issue. Yeah. Like, you have to be super careful with your words and you have to be really careful, you know, um, you know how you treat certain topics. And it's a bit too much. It's a bit too kind of censored and, 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 and you know, a bit too fluffy these days. And then on the right, it's like, <laughs> it's like the complete opposite. No like punch in the face, yeah. racist. It is what it is. This is who I am. And I'm super, you know, I'm super believer in this. And I'm super vocal about it. And it's... And that's the problem is that there, there's no more in between. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's kind of fucked up. It's a weird world to live in. Yeah. Uh, but the no, the no in between thing is a problem. Yeah. Because if you're, either, you, you know, you're in effect creating a social divide between people and a, and a hard social divide. You know, you know I'd, I'd almost liken it to like um, football rivalries in the sense of you are, you know, in, in for me, it's Ipswich or it's Norwich. But if you are either a hardcore fan of something <laughs> and not, and then there's no in the middle, you can't like, oh, I like the, you know, I like Norwich a little bit, or I like Ipswich. But in society now, well, those, those are football teams apparently in uh, the UK. Yeah, well, Ipswich and what, what porridge? What was it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to correct that. That's good. But but, um, but yeah, I, I completely. So agree. you know, <laughs> jokes aside. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. So the fact that there is no there is no middle ground. And that's what's starting to come out. And then amplified, if we go back to what we started with, with uh, Facebook and social networks, where's the problem in uh, social media today? The learning algorithms, the way that um, the way that it serves you content, serves information, the way that distributes the things that you put on. You know, in 2016, we saw your, you basically created bubbles that basically were an echo chamber of your own beliefs. Yeah. Now we're being, there's more of that manipulation coming in, in the sense of, and I think you you can probably explain this better, but you know before we even think it or know it, we're already being influenced and guided to that point. So the problem is the, the problem that I see with social media and like with news feeds and 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 and, and stuff like, especially on Facebook and Instagram, whatever, and Twitter is maybe not so much Twitter, but but still, you are if you post a piece a, a piece of content, it's only going to get more eyeballs uh, depending on engagement. Mm-hmm. And the problem with hate speech is that it's so polarizing that whether you're for or against it, you're going to engage with it, right? So if somebody says something you completely disagree with, right? Yeah. Something like, beaches suck. I completely disagree with that, and I'm going to defend the beach, right? And if I comment on it, then more people are going to see it because I've engaged with it. And so the mm-hmm. algorithm the back end is saying, oh, this is an interesting piece of content. People are going to comment on it. And then on both sides, more people are going to comment. And the more argument there is, the more debate there is, the more polarizing the topic, good or bad, left or right, the more you'll see it. So, so on one side of the spectrum, I kind of, I'm afraid of hate speech and I think that something needs to be done to control it, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure that that's the job of the platform. Yeah. Because the platform is supposed to expose you to relevant things. And what's relevant to you is what's relevant to your audience and to your crew and to your, 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 your circle of friends and influence. Mm-hmm. So you should see whatever people are, are you know, you know, t- talking about. And I think that's yeah. fine. And that's, that's accountability, by the way. Mm-hmm. So I'm totally down with that. That's why I don't understand personally, fully, maybe I'm, I'm super ignorant to the topic, but I don't fully understand or agree with the fact that Facebook is responsible to control in some shape or form hate speech. Now, if they took the approach that Twitter did, which is like fact checking, mm-hmm. that's a different thing. I mean, 
uh, correct or incorrect, I think is 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 there's room for that anywhere, yes, anytime, uh, right? Yep. But like controlling hate speech, <clears throat> right? Like like don't get me wrong. I think there are also limits to that. If someone goes yeah. and you know uh, you know goes on Facebook and says I'm gonna kill you know 52 people. You that's know, a crime. That, you know, that's a yeah. crime. It's it's and it's and it's inciting kind of violence and I don't know what, right? Yeah. Now, part of the argument of, of why people are against Facebook and trying to you know hold them accountable to controlling hate speech is because they're saying that some people, I'm not going to say who, but some people are promoting um, kind of uh, violence against uh, Black Lives Matter protesters, or they are. Um, th- there's a bunch of these things it's like, you know, so, so when, w- when a post gets, you know, posted on Facebook and somebody is saying, you know, Black Lives Matter post- protesters, you know, are wrong or, you know, we need to hurt them or, or, or some sort of violence. They're saying, people are saying that Facebook needs to do something to control it. Mm-hmm. Now, irrespective of your political views or your racial views or your equality views or whatever. Now, the problem is not the fact that somebody you know, in my opinion, obviously, you know, the whole Black Lives Matter movement is super important. And, and, and the idea is not to say that we shouldn't defend, you know, the BLM kind of movement. The thing is, the fact that somebody believes that they should do or incite violence against these protesters is fundamentally the problem. Mm-hmm. And the fact that they're saying that on a platform that exposes them and holds them accountable, I think is, in some sense of the way, a good thing. Because if they weren't doing it on yeah. Facebook, they'd be doing it silently in groups of behind course. their backs and it'd be like this underground movement that nobody would be aware of and it could be very dangerous because you're unaware of what's happening. Now, society's kind of demons are exposed to the world, yeah. right? And I think in one way, I'm kind of like, okay, well, if that's what you believe, then at least I know that's what you believe now. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now I can like earmark you and say, okay, you're a dickhead, so I'm just gonna put you in that group or you know, you're bad so I can watch you and keep an eye on you. You know, so in, in, in a kind of way, it exposes the demons of society. And I don't think it's the platform's responsibility to say, no, you're not allowed to say shit like that. Like, if yeah. you're a hateful, mean person, mm-hmm. like, I'd rather be aware of it than you just sit in the closet one day and, you know. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about the whole thing. Um, and I kind of, this is what I, I really want to talk about this with you, which was, like, our brands kind of getting on the bad bandwagon of boycotting Facebook because they fundamentally have this purpose inside them where they feel they have to stand up for what's right and whatever, or are they just doing it because it's good for kind of awareness and branding and positioning? Is it, is it a, is it a commercially driven decision in your opinion, or is it really a purpose driven decision? Oof. <clears throat> I mean, what's the tagline? The, the hashtag is, um, Stop hate speech for profit, right? Any brand, every brand, purposeful brands, they they are they, there is popularity in that because it is profitable for for brands to take a position because and we've spoken about this a couple of times, but it is profitable for brands to take a position um, and follow the audience and the audience trends and what people are doing in terms of. You know what people are standing up for, what they're speaking about. If they're, you know, if they are more likely to to fall on the side of the majority, then it's more likely that they will take a stand um, on that. But but it's not even a thing about majority. I find. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't even think it's about the underdog. I I, mm. I don't really think that brands. I think. I think really smart brand strategists and brand leaders or organizational leaders that understand the human psyche and kind of have been working with consumers for a long, long time. I think, and there are great examples of those brands. I think Nike is one of them and Mm -hmm. and we'll get into that in a second. But I think like when you understand the way people think and when you know that in the society that we live in where everything is mass produced and you're trying to stand out You know, like, you know, everything is fast fashion. Everything is, you know, in the click of a button. Anybody has access to anything right now. Mm -hmm. And brands understand that people want to kind of be their own selves, express themselves and be unique and be different. Right. So if you know that, you know that if you have an opinion that might not be mainstream Mm -hmm. and it might be even polarizing, whether or not the consumer agrees with it or not is besides the point. Yeah. It's the attitude that they love, right? So it's like, you know, I might not agree with what somebody says or somebody thinks, 
but damn, that guy's fucking cool. He's got a pair of balls. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know, like, um, what's that boxer, that Irish boxer? What's his name? Oh, um, McGregor. McGregor. I don't like him. I think he's not my kind of guy. I don't think I'd get along with him. I don't think we'd be friends if I met him. But I look at him, I'm like, man, that guy's like, he's, he's got something. Like, yeah. I want to know what he's up to. I want to be aware of what he's doing. You know what I mean? Like, he's definitely not the kind of guy I want to hang out with. But I want to kind of be aware of what he does, what car he drives, what mm-hmm. kind of house he has, what watches he wears, where he shops. But I hate him. But I kind of want to know what he does. Yeah. Why? Because he's different. He's not like everybody else. He speaks out. He, he speaks out. He's unapologetic. And obviously, we're big fans of people that are mm-hmm. speaking out and are bold, yeah. right? So if you're Nike, if you're like Coca-Cola, if you're Diageo, if you're whatever these brands are that pulled out of the you know, Facebook marketing, like even if the majority of the world you know, doesn't agree with like stopping hate speech and the role of Facebook, they're doing it because... Mm-hmm. It'll make them, number one, get talked about on CNN, breaking news. It gets clicks. It gets clicks. Yeah, yeah. You know, everybody left or right is going to talk about these brands, whether they approve with withdrawing mm-hmm. from, you know, Facebook or not. Like whether it's Breitbart yeah. or whether it's CNN or NBC or Fox or, you know, whatever channel you're watching, everyone's going to talk about it. Right? Yeah. So it's like you're, these brands are not, in my opinion, they're not doing it out of purpose. Like, mm. and, and. And some might, right? Like the first guy who does it probably does it out of purpose, yep. right? The first brand that like takes that decision based on like, you know, nothing to do with press or attention or whatever, then it might be out of purpose, right? I, I don't know. I yeah. don't want to make a general statement, but like, like most brand strategists and most people that build brands make decisions based on customer insights. They don't like brands, unfortunately, today aren't led by one person deciding what is good and bad and what's right and wrong and we should do this. And it's very difficult to get that kind of alignment in big brands. Right. Yeah. So I don't I don't necessarily believe that's how people approach it. I think they're just very smart and strategic about it. But a large part of it now with the um, with some of the brands is the if you, if you think about it, the role of brands in society today, the influ- and we talk about influence, so you talk about McGregor. Um, you know, in terms of the influence that he has and that you would be influenced by understanding kind of what he's doing. Watches, you like watches. I love a lovely watch. watch on right now. Yes. <laughs> um, but th- that influence is there. So there is an argument to be made that the the boycotting of Facebook, it, you know, there is, there is an underlying um, good in that, in the sense of when you look at what's happening around the world today, you know, and you have that much influence and you have the ability to influence. Oh, it's, 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 would you, would you take a stand even? It's crazy. It's, it's so funny. I've, I've, and you know where I stand on this, right? I, yeah. I have a particular kind of understanding of how the world works now. <clears throat> the reason brands have more influence than anything else nowadays is because brands actually react directly to how consumers think or believe mm-hmm. what they want and what they don't want. Historically, that used to be the role of politicians. Mm-hmm. Politicians used to represent the people. And you used to elect officials or support officials that you had the same values or belief systems yeah. with. Politics and people have become so kind mm-hmm. of divided, right? It's I mean, separate. politics are driven by economic kind of you know, yeah. incentives, right? So, so that world seems very, very different. When I think about you know, Canadian politics that I can kind of understand, American poli- politics, et cetera, I look at Lebanon, et cetera. Most of these countries politically are driven, you know, one, I think the democratic process in those countries are, are questionable, but, but mm-hmm. for multiple reasons. I don't think it's a question of, of corruption necessarily. I think it's a question of the challenges that come with like a two-party system <laughs> instead of like a... But we, we, I'm not a politician. I don't want to get into politics. I hate politics. But, but generally, I think politics has failed in representing the people. Mm-hmm. And hence, people are kind of, kind of hoping and wishing that brands kind of fill that gap and brands are filling that gap but the problem is brands are filling that gap for commercial gain yeah right so it's like it's almost like a false kind of uh yeah. representation of people it's like oh i want to help the environment so much i'm a great brand buy my shit yeah right it's not like oh i want to help the environment really really bad just because i want to help the environment really really bad mm. and that's fine i'm not saying that's bad you can do good uh, and make money at the same time because that's what I believe in. That's what we believe in. That's why yeah. Duck Life exists. So I actually prefer in that model. I think that's mm-hmm. the best model today. Yeah. Because you can't turn your back on like 
consumerism or capitalism and say this no, no, doesn't no. work, change the world. Not so I, I don't believe in that. But <clears throat> but fundamentally, yes, roles. The brands have roles today because of the gap in politics yep. and the underrepresentation that they have um, in the societies that they live. Right. Because of the in. gap, <clears throat> and because of it, and you touched on it earlier, the 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 access to information the transparency that comes with it, right? So everything was there in society um, previously. Now, everything existed. It's just now, and we've spoke, we spoke about it in previous episodes where you spoke about convenience and you know, access to information and the speed that that comes with. But now every, that access is there for everyone to see. This is where you know, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, all of this comes up. So everything is on display now. So yes, there is a huge gap in terms of you know, who represents who. Then you have the layer on top, which is the total separation. You're either left or you're either yeah. right. So there's no in between. And then you've got that danger now of who fills the gap, which is where we're at today. So whenever there's a gap, it gets filled. So that's going, you know, someone is playing that role. I think where we're at today in this conversation is, you know, brands are starting to step up and say, okay, this is wrong. They're determining that that's wrong, that that point of view is wrong. So those brands are taking a position that they are more left, but they're going to feel, try and be in the middle and fill that gap. Um, you know, what, what is going to be the role of private companies coming out the back of this when we look into kind of what's happened with everything over the last three, four months and beyond? And then if we're going into 2021 and 2022, what do you think for brands and private companies, private entities, are, is, is politics going to catch up? No, I don't or, think so. I don't, and I don't think that there's necessarily a place for it to catch up. I, I think society's evolved so much, right? I think that like... Yeah, yeah I don't disagree. Like, I, 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 I feel like like younger generations are just not that interested in politics anymore because they don't understand or have seen the impact that it has on their lives on a day-to-day, -day, right? I think society is kind of like somewhat becoming self-governed through yeah. brands, through technology, through the internet, through transparency, yeah. through... We live in a much more transparent world but dangerously also through and i'm gonna hate on them the media yeah um, and the, the you know if you talk of if you talk of a you know the corporations that have gained the algorithm system for clicks and for profit the media world is very much at the forefront of that you know when we talk about you know headlines that are clickbait clickbait back in the day when we used to yeah you know, I mean, early days of marketing right it was yeah. you know you put a, a freebie in a subject header now yeah. it's vile toxic like devastating the world is ending headlines i mean everybody does it right i, I don't I think know. you have a choice right like what, but that like, doesn't make it right no? like this podcast lauren's gonna help us cut out a piece mm -hmm. where i'm gonna say something or you're gonna say something either super funny or super controversial or that is but that's the you know, fight for it. It's the fight for attention. Right. But I think that that's probably the only place and, and the only topic, the only industry where I'm like, kind of like, I don't know if society <laughs> is mature enough to manage, you know, freely. And I think that's media, right? I think I'm, I'm so afraid mm. of the power of media today, right? If brands wanted to, I mean, my opinion here, and just sorry to cut you off, but just to jump in, anyone, you want to boycott Facebook, boycott the freaking media. If the world started boycotting the media, that's how you change society and you change behavior. Boycotting Facebook for trying to censor or for not censoring or putting a tag on a... On how do you boycott media? Stop watching it. Stop clicking. Just, re, just so the media today is social media. Mm, to it, yeah, that's where it's distributed. But if you, you know, you would have to go after media from the social point of view, from the direct channels, from websites, you would have to go after it across all. And just remove either stop looking, stop clicking on things that are promoting um, hate, or or just don't watch it at all. So, yeah, I mean, but you have to be aware, right? A society needs to be aware, right? So it's like, how do you not engage or participate or consume mm -hmm. media? It's very difficult. And and how do you select what is good or bad or right and wrong? What is true or what false? Is true what or is false? real? What and is fake? And that's like, the that's dilemma the that we're living right? in. And that's, a, and that's the dilemma of social media right now, right? It is. And you think back in the day, the, you know, the, the journalism code, you know, uh, what was the film? It was a, it was a really good film. Um, I know which one you're talking about. You know about. which one I'm talking about, right? It's the, he was for it. the New York Times. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was almost like the first break of the, the journalist code of ethics. Um, and I'm not going to hate on all journalists. Um, but isn't the need because of the society's need for access to information immediately and be the first and get the click and get the views like that instantaneous 
dopamine hit that's there today, like the, the speed that's required to get those stories out, whether they're right or wrong, false, we'll correct, we'll, we'll submit a, um, a rebuttal. You know, that's kind of where we've got to today. And now it's just a, a stream. Like the yeah. news breaks faster on Twitter than it does on any other platform. If you, if you hear something's happened, the first place you go, I go to Twitter straight away. But, but, but it's crazy, right? I think that's fundamentally the problem, right? So the world does not care about quality anymore. Yeah. Funda- in, in whatever topic. Quality or truth. Yeah, yeah, we're but starting to, uh, we're getting down um, that route. Yeah, almost one of the same kind of thing, right? So I think I think you know audiences and consumers just don't care about quality. Mm. They care about speed, affordability, convenience, whatever. They don't care about quality, yeah. right? Like we all wear like ten dollar t shirts. It's true. No matter how much money you have, how much disposable cash you have, we all wear ten dollar t shirts. Yeah. Right. We all want you know everything today or latest tomorrow. We all kind of want to consume content as fast as possible, as quick as possible. And back in the day, I mean, if you remember when we first started doing marketing, we used to spend production budgets of like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And now it's like, okay, how can we shoot it on an iPhone like this podcast? Exactly. Yeah. Right. So quality is kind of going out the window yeah. in, in, in exchange for like speed. Yeah. So in a topic or in an industry or in a kind of you know, world of journalism and real and right or wrong and accurate or inaccurate or, or whatever. Like, how does a journalist fucking compete? Mm. He's competing against, you know, Kim Kardashian getting a new pair of shoes. Like, Wait, he's competing yeah. and against right? you and me. Or like Kanye West signing a deal with Gap. Who cares? Yeah, who gives a shit? Right? Yeah. But, but I care. I read, the, I read the story and I, you know, I engaged yeah. with it. I spent, you know, more than three minutes and I so all of a sudden I'm, well, a, Kanye I'm, West. I'm a data set now, you know, like... Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, it's crazy. like, it's, yeah. so at the end of the day, how, how do you fucking navigate this world, right? How do you decide to not engage with media? I don't yeah. think that's possible. And, and, and to go back to the original topic of how do you kind of police and, and manage Facebook and hate speech and all this shit? <clears throat> I, I actually don't know. But, but, but what, I, what, what I do think is that fundamentally, there's a... Um, I don't want to get all like meta and shit, but like fundamentally, I think everything drives down to the simple fact, in my personal opinion, this is what I believe, that the reason you have so much hate speech, the reason people have so much hate in their heart, the reason everything is so fucked up all the time and getting worse is because there is a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger gap between rich and poor. Yes. Right. And I think fundamentally, we speak about this all the time, but real value creation or where the value creation of our world is like we're supposedly progressing as a society here and globally and technology is making the world an amazing place. And, you know, we can communicate and then and, and have, you know, video conferencing calls with anyone in the world and we can, you know, send, you know, rovers to Mars and mm-hmm. we can have self landing rockets yeah. like Elon Musk. We can have electric cars. We can have all this stupid shit. But that's the bubble for the rich. But, 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 the, but. The gap between societies, social classes, is as big as it's ever been. The access to information, to education, to opportunity, that privilege gap is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And hence, the only way you can express yourself is with anger. Yeah. And you're going to point that anger at something. Mm-hmm. It might be something racist-driven. It might be something kind of, you know... Yeah. So, sexist-driven, it might be whatever it is, you're going to point that anger somewhere. You have to, you know, you're, you're angry, you're suffering, you're, you're working your ass off, you're not making any progress. I look at Lebanon right now, one dollar is 8,000 pounds. Yeah. Like a year ago, it was like 1,500 yeah. or 2,000, right? Salaries are not increasing. People are getting paid what used to get paid $100 a month and like, oh shit, you have no money. You're only getting $100 a month. That same person today is getting $20 a month. Yeah today in the span of three weeks and the cost of goods has not gone down no 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 that right yeah, like i'm yeah, hearing of stories in in, in 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 lebanon from friends and family that people are doing barter to survive yeah right so so man we're talking about you know you know like facebook and all this shit but like mm-hmm. fundamentally i think the problem is the reason is you know why aren't we solving why we have hate speech to begin with why aren't we solving why people are so polarizingly right or polarizingly left well, that's you, the fundamental problem you know what right? it comes down to or it comes down to the question that you asked me which is what's trending in society how do you get you know how are you going to move with people like no one brands aren't solving the problem by boycotting facebook to your point that but is is a brand's responsibility to solve the mass inequality gap 
that is only getting bigger and bigger. They have a role to play. No, but they they, they can change the narrative. Yes. Right. So they can change the narrative and and like because brands right now are also super strategic. They're either going to pick one group or another group, mm-hmm. and they're going to pick the majority group because I think everyone agrees there are more. They're less racist than non-racists. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so you're gonna pick the bigger group of the two. There are more good people than there are bad people. I mm-hmm. hope, right? Yeah. So generally, brands are gonna follow the trend of what's good for their brand. But fundamentally, should a brand be saying, "Oh, I'm with this guy or this girl, and I'm not with this guy," or should they say, "You know, you're all cool. Let's just figure out the issues." Which is changing the narrative, changing and bring the narrative. it back to real value creation. How do you solve the mass inequality gap? Which is only getting bigger and bigger and bigger and your example of Lebanon is just showing like what happens when when a system reaches breaking point when it collapses then it just implodes which is the implosion that you're now seeing yeah and it's 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 I don't know I think listen I'm I'm still super optimist right I I still think 2020 2021 things are gonna just things are gonna improve I think I think the world just got a big slap in the face and 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 it kind of exposed all of our demons everywhere right but I think yeah. fundamentally, at least we've exposed them now. But question, um, <clears throat> and I think we both take a stab at it. What has to change for the optimism of 2020 and 2021? So sure, on the table, things are exposed. Um, we're seeing brands take positions and movements. We're seeing people rise up against, um, you know, against the system, society, the way they've been treated with the BLM movement. Um, but what has to change for 2021 fundamentally for us to learn and actually take action and not just paper over it with a few campaigns or trending topics or conversations that will then disappear? What has to change? That's a big, big question. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. I mean, I have I have small perspective. Um, am, I, am I playing with my fingers? I'm making too much noise. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted. Um, what needs to change, in my opinion, is, is basically the narrative. Yeah. I think people need to stop thinking that they need to choose one or another. That's not the way the world works. It's not always yin or yang. It's not always A or B. It's not always black or white. It's like, like there are so many different opinions, so many different cultures, so many different societies, so many different layers to, 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 to the world that you, you can't always just assume that everyone's going to think the way that you think. And it's okay to have, a, uh, you know, I think fundamentally, like the world that we live in, especially when I look at like Dubai or the Middle East, people are afraid of conflict, mm. right? Like, like if every company I've ever been a part of, um, you know, from, from, from back in the day in, in Canada to companies, you know, that I also started in Canada and in the US and then Rocket Internet here, Kareem, Noon, you know, OSN, and even sometimes, you know, Duck Life itself. None of these companies are perfect, far from it. But in none of those companies was, was kind of, and maybe this is not the right word, but was debate or conflict kind of encouraged. Yeah. Everything's always swept under the rug. Swept right? under the rug or dealt with behind closed doors. Exactly. And, and, and the truth of everything is never exposed. So I think what needs to happen, number one, authenticity and accountability, right? I think, <clears throat> I think that's critical. Mm-hmm. Number two, I think people got to stop being afraid of, of disagreement. Yeah. And it's okay. Like, I don't have to believe in what you believe and you don't have to believe in what I believe and you, we don't have to have the exact same ethos, but we have a set of values that we agree on and that's why we live in the society in harmony, right? Like, yeah. like you can be you and I can be me, right? And, and I'm not yeah. going to judge you for being you and you're not going to judge me for being me. And I think that's fundamentally the issue that needs to be kind of confronted. I think people are just so scared, so scared of conflict. Yep. Because we live in this world where everything is super fragile and we're like, man, everyone needs to be exactly the same in order for everyone to get along. And I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that either. Right? And I think, I think that's one big societal issue. I think acceptance and tolerance and kind of like, like accountability and authenticity are, are, are kind of two, two things. So like mm-hmm. tolerance and, and authenticity, I think, are critical. And then I think... Um, what needs to change is, is, is the fundamental kind of narrative that, that, that people in power or platforms in power or media outlets, et cetera, need to kind of change. Like it can't always be us or them. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like we've been hearing us or them since like... 2016. Before. Probably before, but... Right? Like, like, I, remember like, I remember like post-2001. 
Yeah, you're right. right? Actually, if you go back to if you go back yeah. to if you go back to September 11, all that stuff. Yeah, Bush Blair era. Yeah, yeah, it was very like you're either with us or against us. <laughs> yeah, right. And 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 that narrative started, right? Mm. You know, I don't want to get political, but I'm just saying that's when that kind of narrative started. Yep. You're either with us or you're against us. Yeah. You're either a yeah. or you're not. Yeah. You know what I mean? Agreed. It was super weird. Yeah. Super, super weird. And then that's when the divide started, right? I remember, I remember the first time I went back to Saudi Arabia after 13 years, 14 years. I hadn't been there in a long time. I went back in 2000, I think, 14, 2013, 2014. And I was with Rocket Internet at the time. And it felt like fundamentally a different place. In what sense? I left in 2001, right before September 11th. And in Saudi Arabia, there was... I loved growing up there. It was amazing. And I was an expat kid with super long hair and I loved Michael Jordan. And I was like, I was like this cool Western kid living in, in Saudi Arabia. And I never felt out of place. Saudi Arabia was a home for me. It was a home. I went back in 2013, 2014, much less expats, much less Western expats. And there was a very big distinction like Arabs and non-Arabs. It was very weird. I didn't mm. feel like it was home anymore. I felt yeah. like I was an expat. I felt very kind of, and I don't think it's because Saudi Arabia has like, you know, a change of, of, of like opinion on expats. No, not at all. I just think people distinctively started to associate themselves by a set of beliefs yeah. that was a narrative being pushed oddly by the West, not even locally. Right? Right. It's like, you're either with us or against us kind yeah. of narrative. And then that shit just like snowballed and snowballed and snowballed and snowballed and yeah. snowballed. And then you have, you know, the Trump 2016, you know, and that mm. just, that was just fuel on a fire. The fire was started long ago, even probably before that, right? Yeah, the fire has been going a long time. But no, I think, I think you're, you're, you're totally right in terms of that separation that us or them, and that fundamentally is what needs to shift and change it's crazy man like i uh, the other day and i don't want to people are going to have opinions about mentioning this guy or not but it's a super funny thing when you compare like the 90s right the 90s and 80s and 90s was like a very different time right coming out of like the cold war and all that stuff and it was a time of prosperity and growth i think globally everything was changing if you think about how content has changed Mm. I don't remember what year it was. I think we could we could search it, but like, like the song of the year was like "We Are the World." Oh yeah, like Michael Jackson, like in the streets, "We are the world, <laughs> we are the people." <laughs> right? Yeah. It was super like, let's all get together. We accept all races. Everything yeah. is cool. Da 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 da. Like all governments and politicians were making peace agreements for trade were becoming yeah. global. The EU was coming together. Was globalization, right? NAFTA was amazing. Yeah. The US and Russia were homies. You had Clinton and what's it, Yeltsin laughing and getting drunk together all the time, right? Yeah. Like the world was very peace and accepting and that was the narrative that let's make the world a better place. Yeah. Not to quote MJ, but like that was kind of the narrative. Today, man, it's like everything's about like divide and yeah. us versus them and nationalism and tearing up agreements and you know the un yeah. let's not support the un let's defund the un that was like a couple of years ago yeah. and then it's like all this crap like everything now is like ripping up all the bridges that were built it's a very different narrative i'm not saying the yeah. 90s were more tolerant don't get me wrong we were way worse back then in terms of like yeah you know the markers of like a good society like we were way worse in the 90s but i'm just saying the narrative back then was completely different. So is it, you know, going back to the inequality Bring Michael gap. Jackson back. That's yeah, the solution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Prince. Oh, and, 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 and James Brown. And yeah. Bring back all these guys in the world to be a better yeah, place. Yeah. Celine true. Dion, where are you? <laughs> Whitney Houston. Oh, you know what I mean? Love Whitney. I don't know. But I'm just saying, I feel like it's funny because uh, just randomly it came up on YouTube and it played, you know, that Michael Jackson video. I was like, holy shit, I haven't heard a good song mm. about spreading yeah, yeah. happiness in What's a long the time. One? Um, it was one out recently, the, um, the Earth one, Earth song with... Um, yeah, what's his name? DiCaprio, Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, but, but, but what, it was all the, it was all the what's artists. What's that rapper's name? Ah, uh, um... I know Beaver is in it. <laughs> What's his name? He's like some sort of weirdo. Uh, he's cool though. Ah, oh, the uh, guy's got his own TV show, the... Um, Earth song. Yeah. What's his name? Michael Jackson popped up. 
Little Dicky. Little Dicky, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> the Earth yeah, we need more of that for sure. That's it's amazing. The problem. Yeah, but um, I was going to say the you know kind of the world that you were describing in, in the eighties and nineties where everything came together, but like on that watch, on that watch is where the inequality gap has what has it widened or has yeah, it it's totally widened yeah okay so it's widened it's not just that we're more aware of the widening or that it's that it no no i mean widened. all the data that we have i mean we, we we did that thing right on real value so you creation. can understand why so to a large extent you and i guess you know not that this is right but you can understand why we go from one extreme of everyone hugging and you know songs <laughs> together to the extreme of you know let's wind back globalization let's think very insular it's make america great again it's like brexit we've got to like take our island back like there's that far right extreme that then comes in so i guess the hope is that that middle ground of okay what's the learnings from okay what do we learn on how not to do things on there you know during this time of like bringing things together you know we don't like where we're going today history doesn't repeat but it rhymes if you know any historians are listening then we know kind of what happens when fascism rises up far too much um so that middle ground of you know how do we learn given the fact that we have all of the information that we have that we have access to information that we know the problems that are there if we change the narrative if we shift the way that people are then in theory we should be no we should be we, we are no better place now than we ever have been in history to course correct and solve some of the fundamental problems that I mean, society has. I mean, yeah, it depends on what markers you're looking at, right? So, like, if you're looking at, like... Well, we have to agree you know, on a super, common objective. Yeah, yeah but, a, but, but the thing is, like, like, somebody can come here and say, yeah, well, you know, uh, infant mortality rate is the lowest it's ever been and uh, life expectancy is the highest it's ever been. And, and like, I mean. We're uh, going to get politics again. You know, and, and, and all this shit. But, but, yeah. but I think, like, if those are the measures of progress, which we're still measuring, then that's fundamentally the problem. I think, I think what happened... And just to your point, is like in in the eighties and nineties, you know, there was a lot of conflict that was resolved, mm-hmm. right? I think there was like, uh, I mean, I I don't know enough, and sorry for my ignorance on the topic, but I just like maybe there were more conflicts back then than there were today, or polarizing or very kind of big conflicts, and it was an era of fixing shit fixing relationships building bridges between societies and cultures and shit like that and then and then we were distracted with all this like we are the world let's make the world a better place and boy bands and girl bands and and all this stuff and like you know the hip-hop came around and everyone had a you know all these minorities globally whether it's hip-hop or whether it's different types of music around the world everyone has a way to express themselves and expressing yourself was a great thing and art and music and culture was a great thing movie business was booming you know, creativity was booming. And I think we were all distracted with this stuff, right? And, and with the development of like technology too, the distribution and access to entertainment yeah. was kind of the name of the game. And everyone got distracted with entertainment. So like the 90s and the early 2000s, it's all about entertainment. And the whole world got distracted. Meanwhile... Or the world with access. Yeah, the world with access got distracted and, 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 and we just became the biggest consumers of like entertainment. Music, movies, tabloids, whatever, yeah. right? And then in the meantime, in the background, what actually happened while the world was distracted, this is my personal opinion, is, is those in power kind of you know, consolidated more power, right? whether mm-hmm. it's through media or consolidation of businesses or industries or what have you. So meanwhile, like, the world is a great place. And I don't think that there's like this evil company in the back saying, oh, I'm going to get more power. I just think that that's just what happened. It's just a natural evolution of money, like money makes money. And yeah, yeah. You know, just the, the wealth kind of just snowballed. I don't think, I, I genuinely don't think that, you know, billionaires are all evil. No. Right? I, I, I don't, I cannot believe that. Like, yeah. so, so I think while the world was being entertained and not aware of what was going on and distracted and not really working on kind of their self awareness and progress as people, as societies, mm. we're just consuming content endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. I think, you know, you know, media companies and wealthy people just ended up getting more and more wealthy. And I think technology, you know, fostered that, mm-hmm. right? And I think over time, now we reached a point, okay, well, there's so much concentration of wealth. Yeah. 
the whole world, you know, for a long time didn't care because they had great movies and great music and Instagram and Facebook feeds and, you know, Twitter feeds to kind of get distracted. And all of a sudden, you know, the world got a slap in the face, whether it's with COVID or in some societies or countries, other scenarios. Yeah. And all of a sudden, there was a gaping kind of, there's like an elephant in the room that everyone's like, oh, shit, maybe we should pay attention to that elephant. Yeah. And I think that's what ended up happening is that there's, society has become so distracted that it hasn't focused on its own demons. Yeah. And when I say society, I mean rich and poor. Mm-hmm. Like I don't, I cannot, and we should not, and I will not tell anyone that I think that the rich are evil and the poor are, 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 are all like... But innocent. that comes back to the, the narrative that's been drilled in, if we go back, is the us and them. Yeah, yeah. So and the I, have, the have not. Yeah, so I, I'm not going to so feed that. Demonized. No, yeah, no, and I, shouldn't I, demonize. And I don't want to feed that, but I, I also think that fundamentally the issue is that society was not mature enough or responsible yeah. enough to deal with their shit. Yeah. Because they got so consumed in their own world or this fake world yeah. that the whole world is living in. I mean, I probably spend more time on Instagram and Facebook than I do in my emails and working. I probably spend more time on Instagram what? and Facebook and Twitter <laughs> than I do speaking to any of you guys. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. Which means I live in, in, another, in a virtual world. Mm-hmm. Hence, it means my effort and yeah. energy is not spent in the real world that I live in trying to fix my own shit. Yeah. Right? So if everyone is living like we're living, mm-hmm. and the majority world is, because we know now that you know, the majority of the planet, six billion of them are online, of yeah. which half of those people, 3.5 billion people are actually on social media globally. Yeah. And it's an addiction, it's a drug. But now we come back to the problem. So the problem is fucking social media. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so boycott boy Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> 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 No, but seriously. No, 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 bitch. <clears throat> but no, but fundamentally, it's, yeah, not, yeah. it's not boycott Facebook because they're promoting hate speech or they're not yeah, doing yeah. anything for hate speech. It's, it's holy shit, we're not living in the real world. But we're that's n- fundamentally the problem, which means we're not solving any of our shit. Yeah, yeah, but com- that's then compounded by the fact that that virtual world that we're living in is being served to us. And we are then translating that serving of that real world into our world. So there is something happening behind the scenes yeah but i i think like, I, I think fundamentally the problem i think fundamentally the problem now that we've come full circle on this topic fundamentally the problem is 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 our inability to understand how to manage or live in a world with kind of the internet and social media mm. right because it's not like it's not social media it needs to be it's life right like social media is life but that's education and like can you imagine how we need to teach our kids like you know, I think of niece, nieces and nephews and it's like, can you have access to iPhone or iPad and play games? But in school now, if we're talking about, you know, kids growing up, then we have to educate. But what are we going to educate? Who are we to educate, by the way? Because we fucked it up. <laughs> so. no, but, no, but social media fundamentally is based on basically being so engaging that you do nothing else. Yeah. Well, that's what you're right? rewarded for. It's not like news, right? Like yeah. you watch the news to get news, to be updated yeah. and educated and informed. You read a newspaper because you want to know what happened yesterday. You don't go on Twitter because you want to know what happened yesterday. You want to always know what's going on now because that's where you're living. Yeah. You're living on social media. That's fundamentally the problem. Yeah. Don't live on social media. Live in the real world. Yeah. But you're, re- yeah, that's true. But the real world is your little world that you've got here where social media is opening you up to the whole world, right? Who gives a shit? Do I, do I need to be aware of what's going on all the no, time? I'm not saying... real time in Spain? But you want to be. Yeah, but that's the fundamentally the problem, yeah, yeah. right? We, we've been taught, we've been bred through social media that we need to constantly be you know, Involved. aware of what yeah. Ronaldo is saying so, or yeah. what like Barack Obama believes or what you know, Kim Kardashian is wearing, yeah. right? It's the same in business. If, you're, you know, if you think about it and the problems that you're trying to solve in business, if you're constantly distracted by competition or you're looking over there and that's where you're consuming your time. Like you're not progressing, you're not building. You're exactly, building. everything falls apart internally. And I wonder. I wonder what like what the world will look like in ten years. Because if this keeps happening, another and there's no course correction. I, I don't think we'll get through to ten I, years before. I feel like I feel like at some point there'll be regulation on social media, like mm. l- l- like cigarettes. Like if you go on social media, there's a tax. Or if you go on like, yeah. <laughs> or if you like, you know, you're only allowed like three hours a day, or you're only allowed like, you know, whatever. 
Well, if you think about it, how, <clears throat> and we are kind of governed, yeah, we're kind of governed know, maybe. by a lot of the US, right? Regardless when it comes to social platforms. Like in November, there's obviously an election, which is going to be very important in terms of how that future looks. Because right now the social, I mean, the social media companies have made their play. If there's a re-election rather than a new presidency, he's going to come hard on those platforms. I mean, we'll see, right? And, and I mean, I don't think it's going to be in his interest to dismantle the platforms. I mean, he They're, spends, what, 23 hours a day on Twitter? No, it's not even that. It's, it's the reason he's in office is because of those platforms. So it's, yeah. like, it's like a necessary evil for him. Yeah. They could spread, you know, uh, you know opinions against, uh, that work against them, but they're also the reason he's in office. But he can't remain in office past um, eight years, right? So two terms. So what's he got to lose? Oh, de- he's oh dem- you mean like control? I mean, yeah, control. man, who knows? Man, that's a freaking dark view of the world in the future. But like, I know I've, it's, it's crossed my mind too, of course. But like, yeah, I don't know. I just, it, it kind of feels like, you know, it's crazy. During COVID, during COVID, we spent a lot of time at home. Mm-hmm. And our social media consumption went up. Yep. Right? So uh, I, I can't say who I was talking to, but somebody who works in a social media company that I know well and that shares information with me. I probably shouldn't. Um, basically, on average in the Middle East, it went up double. So the the the, the average time spent on like the Instagram, the Facebooks, Twitters, etc., generally doubled. That's insane, right? And so, so it's weird. And, and I get it, right? Because you're not mm. you you you're you're in confinement at home. So how else do you live in your society if you can't be in your society? Yeah, you're gonna live on right. So I, I get it. I don't think it's necessarily bad. I get it. But the problem is people are unable to dis, like distinct between like real and what's yeah. not real and important or not important, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So you know what, what's going to be a good gauge of measuring if, if to see if we've improved as a society, if we just want to be entertained and not just like if we, if we continue the trend of just being entertained and being unaware is how these new social media platforms are going to evolve. So mm-hmm. like TikTok. Yeah. But it's an entertaining platform, right? Yeah, yeah. But all platforms were an entertaining platform mm. to begin with. To begin with, yeah. Right? They were just like entertainment. They were just pastime. Mm. And then they became political and us versus them and this and that. Yeah. And, and you saw what happened on TikTok during Trump's rally last week. Mm. Yeah. So TikTok, which was a dancing platform. Yeah. All of a sudden, became a political platform. Yeah, through trending hashtag, how to reach the masses, <clears throat> and everyone bought tickets. Well, the kids, the kids bought tickets, and it's cool because the kids did it, and we're like, yeah, power to the kids, and they're our future. But essentially, they're using the platform to go against a political party. Yeah, and it, because you're more left, you'll say that they're bad. You're, you're that they're good, but if you're more right, you'll say that they're bad and they're brainwashed. Mm. Yeah. So I mean. Essentially, the, the cycle repeats itself. Yeah, that's what I mean. History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And now we're in micro history moments, right? So we're just, we're rhyming every two or three years. It's weird. It's like, I sincerely hope, I mean, I have a daughter now. I sincerely hope that she'll have an upbringing and a, a childhood like mine. But I, I'm, I'm fearful that she won't mm. because she'll just be probably living like the rest of the world. Yeah. I went to dinner last night um, at Nassim uh, Jumeirah. Mm. Yeah, and nice. uh, we uh, we went to have a burger. Um, me and a couple of friends, and there was a table right next to us of like uh, like eight kids, probably like early teens, like twelve to like fifteen or something. Man, for like half the dinner, it was just silence. I know what you're gonna say. It was just silence, man. They were out at dinner. Yeah, it was just the guy came and served, put their burgers in front of them, like, oh, here's your food. Nobody jumped on their food. I remember, remember as a kid, you remember when you're like 13, 14, if, if, your- if there was French fries <laughs> in front of you, that's all you would do, right? Yeah, yeah. And then like nobody spoke. They were all on like whatever they were on TikTok or Instagram uh, or, or whatever the hell they were on. I mean, were they at least creating content about the burgers, or were they just like consumed in the, that world? No, I mean, they weren't food bloggers, <laughs> but like, but. Yeah. It, was, it was so shocking, man. It was actually super sad. Why it's very sad to see. It's super sad. Yeah. 
<laughs> and like they would send each other shit and then they would interact and you would see them they'd be like ha ah, oh. send each I'm like just fucking talk to each other or show them the fucking piece yeah, of content yeah. you know what I mean and I'm super I'm super kind of like worried about Charlotte yeah. and like her upbringing because it's gonna be like you know I, I, my mom couldn't pay me to come in the house at dinner yeah I grew up in Saudi in the 90s 80s and 90s and man we spent all day no matter how hot it was all day outside I'm sure it was the same thing for you yeah same in the UK man I would leave yeah. the house at like before lunch and I would come back at like 7 p.m. for dinner. Yeah, same. I would literally, and, and you know, like you never had a mobile phone, right? So you, what used to happen to me is you'd get my like mom or my dad would like- Screaming. Yeah, they'd come outside. Yeah. And if, if I was down in the local park, then they'd like march down the road, like we told you dinner. It's like two hours. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, it's a different world. And it it's, is. it's sad, man, because they don't, they don't come. I feel like- but it's parents' responsibility to be able to provide that balance. Yeah, but how? I, if the I, entire society is I, living online, it's like if you don't let your kid have a phone, you're depriving them from living. I mean, I'm not a parent yet, so I, I'm no, no, the like, worst place to like, put advice on this. But at the same time, like if it's not a case of putting time on it, but if you think about it, uh, I know we're running out of time anyway, but um, if you think about it on, like for me, you think through studying, you think through schooling, and you, you think about school. Like, did you take as much value out of school as you could have or other people did? I certainly didn't. No. Where I took the most development value for me of who I am today was when I traveled, when I went around the world. Experiences. And experiences. And when I came to Dubai, I mean, Dubai, I mean, it's incredible here. You open your eyes to like hundreds of different cultures um, and people. So you, those experiences are what shape you today. So as a parent, Kids, you, I mean, they're going to be on devices. They're going to consume. They're going to be there, but they have to value. They have to find a way to value experiences socially with people, and they have to make their own choices and decisions. And kids grow up much faster today than what what, what we did. Um, but just giving them that perspective on balance is probably the only thing you're going to be able to do because fundamentally, they're going to have their devices and they're going to be consumed, all consumed. But at dinner. Damn, if I was at dinner and I had my phone out, <laughs> not eating the food, I'd get the burger taken away and that would be it. I'd go hungry for the day. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you know what? To go back to the first point and to kind of, I guess, close this, this podcast, we started with brands, you know, taking a stance against Facebook and like um, kind of standing up against hate speech and shit like that. And it's kind of like... Like, I feel like the narrative, the brands who, if they really care, they should be kind of promoting living offline. Yeah. And, and helping people understand that there are two sides to a story. Like, if you were a good brand, I would take a screenshot of somebody's hate speech post, put it on a billboard and say, we know you're a nice person. Kill them with kindness. Right? And I think, I think like, I wish that was the narrative, right? Not like, you know... Hate speeching people are terrible people. Yeah, they're terrible people because they're misinformed and probably don't have the same opportunity and they're angry and all that stuff, but no one's born evil. And I think if brands or communities or societies or governments want to kind of um, have a positive impact rather than pick a side, mm. which is what they're doing, yep. then they could change the narrative and they could say that, right? They could say, hey, you know, uh, fuck the world, one, two, three, uh, whatever your right. handle is. Um, you know, we know you're a good person. We yeah. love you or something, right? Not to sound super cheesy, but like, like that's the narrative we need to be pushing. And also, instead of saying we're not going to advertise on Facebook, we could say we're not going to advertise on Facebook, but we're going to do more, you know, physical events or, 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 or sponsor more, you know, school teams or, you know, we're going to kind of uh, help, you know, high schools build facilities or, you know, you know, encourage, you know, global travel. Like instead of spending, you know, a hundred million dollars on Facebook this year, we're going to create sponsorships for, you know, exchanges, what school exchanges. Yeah. What are they doing with the money, by the way, that they're not spending enough time? Yeah, man. I'm just, and then that's the other thing. Like, I mean, oh, we're not going to spend on Facebook. Yeah, because your sales are shit and uh, spending I mean, isn't, isn't filling the pipeline and might as well <laughs> save your money. And uh, and by the way, if you're not spending on Facebook, maybe give it to your staff that you've kind of laid off or that you've cut their you know salaries by like 50 percent or 75 percent. I like, knew that was tricky. <laughs> oh, fuck. I mean, like, like no one says that shit like, oh, you know, Starbucks is shutting down stores the first time in their history. 
Yeah. Them stopping their Facebook spending is kind of like oh, it's a great way the to point. cut costs, right? And then no, it's like right with my first like yeah. when when Facebook when when uh, Starbucks said, oh, we're gonna stop stop Facebook spending. I was like, you were spending on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Your stores were fucking shutting down. There was no one going to your stores. What are you fucking doing on Facebook anyway? Yeah. Yeah, so true. You know, and like Coca-Cola said they were going to stop spending on Facebook. Didn't they also have a huge drop in mm-hmm. sales and they're for the first huge. time ever? Like yep. they, they're actually like, yeah, yeah, like their business is, is, is getting smaller. Mm-hmm. Like. So, so good the for you. Behind like behind the stop the hate for profit, which potentially, and we're not saying this is the case because I think we should look into it. But you know, there is, and it's the problem, right? There is always an a ulterior motive. Yeah, it should be hashtag support a cause for profit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, on uh, on that note, that's uh, our first episode uh, of I guess of the second season, and the rest of them hopefully will be in here in yeah. case one of us travels and takes a vacation and goes somewhere. Uh, most likely me to be the first one uh, but yeah that yeah. was our first episode Very of good. Duck It for season 2 awesome thanks for listening hope you enjoyed the conversation thanks Steve thanks all cheers Chris